Hello and welcome. Welcome to Alta Live. If you are here in this Zoom webinar to talk about Fresno, the magic, the mystery, the many issues um, surrounding Fresno and the San Joaquin Valley, you are absolutely in the right place. Welcome. This is Alta Live. My name is Beth Spotswood. I am very excited and honored to welcome today's guest, Fresno Land founder Danielle Bergstrom. She is going to, in the next 30 minutes, change the way we see Fresno, enlighten us, those of us who don't know um, about why Fresno is so incredible and important, she's gonna enlighten us. Um, Danielle is an urban planner with over 12 years of experience working in local government, philanthropy, advocacy, and academia in Fresno, the Bay Area, and New York. She's got a master's in regional planning from Cornell um, and a BS in biology from Cal Poly. First, before we begin to talk about Fresno land, Fresno, Danielle, um, some brief housekeeping. Alta Live is the digital event series we do here at Alta Journal. We are a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. If you're unfamiliar with us, I really encourage you to check us out. We've got um, all with cup fiction, um, kind of more long form news, poetry, tons of literature coverage and um, stories about really cool people like Danielle Bergstrom. So um, I hope you'll check out our work. We also host a California book club once a month. In fact, tomorrow, um, Sarah Bynum will discuss likes with John Freeman. So we'll send you links to all of that, as well as a recording of this interview um, this afternoon. Eyes peeled for that, please. There's a Q&A button below our little faces here. Please use that Q&A button to ask any questions you have about Fresno and its environs for Danielle. Um, there's also a chat section. Um, and I love to kind of get the chat started by asking everyone to let us know where they are zooming in from today. I see we've got Denver, um, San Francisco, Mariposa. Welcome everyone. I am in Nevada, California. I looked it up. I am 172 miles from Fresno. Danielle, please tell us that you're, you're zooming in from Fresno. Welcome to my bedroom in Fresno. <laughs> um, I love the intimacy, thank you. So, <laughs> so as, we, as we kind of kick over, I want you to, to first let us know what drew you, what was the magic pull that brought you from working in places like New York and Oakland, um, back to Fresno and kind of uh, the decision to devote your current career to Fresno. Um, well, hi everyone. It's really fun to be here and to see you all and um, special hello to the, to the Valley people. Um, I think Central Valley natives and current residents, we all hold a special place in each other's hearts and there's a camaraderie to being um, in this region and from this region. Um, and I think, as I say this, people from the Valley, a lot of them will understand it, but there's a very magnetic pull to the Valley. It's a very intriguing and mysterious place that holds a lot of contradictions. It is, um, it is both deeply conservative and deeply progressive. It is both um, on the forefront of facing some of our society's greatest challenges, climate change, um, economic crisis and catastrophe. Um, and yet there's so much, despite the, the crises that a lot of us face in this region, there's still so much creativity in it. And, you know, the Valley has produced some of the best writers, Joan Didion, William Saroyan. Um, and you see how the contradictions and chaos produces a lot of creativity. And I think that that is probably what brought me back contradiction in the chaos. Well, we're going to get to Fresno's motto later today, but um, let's stick, let's just put a pin in contradiction and chaos because there might be something there. Um, so can you tell us, you, you formerly worked for the mayor of Fresno, you studied in the East. What is now you founded Fresno Land? Um, and I've been reading it just now in, in Fresno B. Can you tell us about what Fresno Land is and who it serves? Yeah, so we are, um, Fresno Land is a nonprofit news organization. We, our mission is to make policy public. And, and what that means to us is 
Um, we use the, the tool of journalism of writing stories about what's going on in the central San Joaquin Valley as a way to help people understand um, the policy and root causes and history that shapes our neighborhoods and why things are the way they are. And so we're not a breaking news website. We don't cover the who, what, where, when, why, how of the now. We cover the how did we get here? What policies have led to this decision? And we also do that in a way that tries to implore people to get civically engaged so that they know, you know, there are solutions on the table for our housing crisis. There are solutions on the table for our water crisis and our drought crisis. But in order to see those solutions, to get involved in those decisions, this is how you do that. So that's what we're all about at Fresno Land. And we co-publish with the Fresno Bee. So if you want to read our, our stuff, fresnob.com slash fresnoland and we're also in the process of building out our own website as well were those issues not being covered were, was that fresno yeah. B, you felt that fresno b or whomever in the region wasn't wasn't really hitting on those issues you know there's a there's a national crisis this is certainly not unique to fresno in any way shape or form um in that the, the journalism industry as a whole has just re been really gutted and the business model has been upended um, because of Facebook and a lot of different shifts in advertising. And so the this traditional beat coverage, um, the reporters that really get to know a beat can really understand the context of certain decisions or certain policymakers and, and put infuse their, their beat with all of that knowledge. That has been lost in a lot of newsrooms across the country. And as an urban planner, you know, I'm not trained as a journalist. I think a lot of people are like, why are you going into journalism? But for me, it was all about how do you get people to understand the context of why decision makers might be looking at a specific decision. And so we have a big housing crisis in Fresno, just like the rest of California. It looks a little bit different here, but it's still nonetheless a huge um, uh, difficulty for so many families. And you know, we want to get at the heart of, you know, why hasn't rent control been on the table? Um, what are the factors around that? Um, we're not just reporting on is rent control, you know, being proposed, why or why not? It's, it's you know, look, going back and peeling back the layers and helping people understand that context more. How does the housing crisis look different in Fresno <clears throat> com compared to the rest of California? Yeah, um, I think it looks different in part because if you are, um, it's not, it's, we have a much larger working class in, in the Fresno area at working and, and working poor population as well. And if you are, you know, a two income family looking to buy a house in Fresno, um, as long as you're kind of like roughly very much in the middle of, of the income range, you're fine. You'll find a house to buy. It's not going to be um, very unaffordable. Um, of course, housing prices are going up here, but you know, my husband and I were two income family. We have two little kids. We were still able to afford a house pretty easily here. That is, and I know that's not the case for people. I mean, I, I moved from Oakland in part because we saw the writing on the wall and we thought, my husband's a teacher. I work in a nonprofit. Like there is no way we're affording a house in Oakland. Um, and in Fresno, we have a huge renting population. The majority of, of our population are renters and we don't have rent control. We don't have um, any sort of stability um, beyond sort of state level policy measures. And so people who are renting are very, very, very vulnerable to the shifts in the housing market. Rents have skyrocketed where I think the set third highest city in the country with the largest rent spikes since the pandemic. Um, and you're seeing homelessness skyrocket as a result of that. Um, so yeah, that's that's how it looks here. But you know, again, if you're middle class, you probably won't feel it as much here. And it's interesting because as population growth in California specifically declines, it is on the increase in Fresno. Right. Are most of those people um families like you and your husband who moved from a insanely expensive region like the bay area to a place like fresno where regular people might be able to buy a house um this is where the data part of me like can't give you a really clean answer because i really want to report on that but the the answer is we don't have the data to confirm that yet but anecdotally, the answer is yes across the board. You talk to realtors, I look at my own street and half of my street has come from LA, San Francisco, Sacramento. Um, 
but yeah, it's, it's a huge, huge part of, of what's happening here. I imagine that shift in population, well, or I could be very incorrect, would change the issues that, and it, let me just clarify, what do we call someone from Fresno? Fresnans? Fresnan. Fresnan. Okay. Mm -hmm. That is that going to, this kind of shift in the demographics of the population is going to change these issues that Fresnans face, the very specific issues that you're covering. And if you look at Fresno Land's website, not only do you have news, but you have guides, um, ways for Fresnans to access resources that are available to them. And I see two main topics come up. One is water and the other is housing for renters, kind of like secure what your rights are, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Do you think that those, I guess water is in and of itself, but in terms of the housing, is that going to shift because, and are people getting pushed out? Or are those working poor getting pushed out of Fresno? Absolutely they are. Yeah. I, um, I followed a family last year who got evicted during the pandemic, which can still happen, even though we have a lot of these, um, eviction protections in place. And, um, and they ended up leaving Fresno. They became homeless, um, <clears throat> lived out of a motel for about a month and then decided to actually move to Mexico because they just were like, there's nowhere in California that we can afford with, with young children and one income. And, and so that you see that happening, but I think people are really, you know, the Valley is a very, um, family is very big here for a lot of people. Um, uh, Multi-generational households are very common. And, and I think there's a, a, a strain in terms of you know, when you leave, you leave your, your, do you want to leave your support system, your network? And so I think people are doing whatever they can to double up, to triple up with family members, to avoid having to go to a, a completely new place without a support network. But that's, that's really tough for a lot of folks right now. Can you talk a little about the water crisis? And at, specifically, I mean, I, as Californians, I think we're all in touch with the drought and, and water issues, but how is it specific to the central San Joaquin Valley and, and solutions around that? Having just read your report on yeah. the land on this. <laughs> so um, in the Bay and in LA, most of your water comes from beautiful rivers in the Sierras that are delivered through these wonderful aqueducts to, to your tap. And um, most, of, most of the time, those, those rivers flow and they exist. And in the valley, we're actually the inverse. Most of our communities rely on water that's under the ground. It's called groundwater. And groundwater is the resource that many people thought would never go away. Um, and turns out climate change is really flipping that on its head. Um, and it's a resource that farmers rely hugely on in the San Joaquin Valley and a lot of smaller communities rely on. And the problem is that when you have a drought, <clears throat> all those rivers that are delivering water to San Francisco, to Oakland, to Sacramento, to LA, those rivers aren't flowing. They're also not delivering water to the reservoirs in the Sierras that are supposed to get water to the farmers. And so when farmers don't have water that they can get from the California aqueduct or the Central Valley Canal, they go to the ground. And so you have these giant straws of wells that farmers use that they have, they can go really deep. And if you are a small city or if you're a private well owner that has maybe a hundred foot well, you can't remotely compete with a farmer who can go to 800 feet. And so that's the challenge that we're seeing most acutely right now is private well owners who are really struggling. I think last year there were maybe 800 um, private well owners who lost their source of water last year. Wow. And, and, but it's, it's not, I mean, if it was just private well owners, that's one thing, but now you have entire communities whose wells are going dry. And we had a community in Tulare County called Teveston. They completely lost their water supply. Um, at the Pandera County, you had a few communities who are losing their water. So it's a huge challenge and it's only going to get worse um, as our droughts get longer and more um, consistent. So, you know, there are some solutions on the table, but I think the biggest solution on the table that is the hardest for uh, folks in the region to really grapple with is how do we scale back the footprint of agriculture? and um, do that in a way that doesn't upend the economy of the Central Valley. And I think that's probably the biggest question that we're all dealing with right now. Do you do any advocacy or, or kind of work within politics or you're just 
given people? No, um, as a, a, once I put my journalism hat on in 2019, you know, I uh, like, I'm a member of the Society of Professional Journalists. I am not an advocate, you know, I write about policies, but don't advocate for specific solutions. And I think um, coming from an advocacy background, I actually, I think that's been really helpful to my career as a journalist, but I actually really appreciate the, the place that I'm situated now where I can go deep in helping people understand the different pros and cons of a solution without having to kind of fully throw myself into, this is the way that we get out of this crisis. Because I think as we all know, it's complicated. There's no one silver bullet to any of this. And it's nice to be able to say, I don't have to claim to pretend that I have an answer here because I don't. Very fair. Um, we're getting questions in the chat, which is great. Thank you, Judith. We will get to questions, folks. Don't forget to use the Q&A button. Again, you're here at Alta Live. We're talking to Danielle Bergstrom, founder of Fresno Land. I want to segue a little bit about, um, oh, before I do segue into the fun stuff, how, what's going on with um, high speed rail? How are you, have you done much reporting around high speed rail and as it relates to Fresno? I know Fresno is going to be yeah. a big stop. Yeah, I have not, um, I have not reported on high speed rail, but um, well, I mean, for a lot of the folks that are not from Fresno or haven't driven through Fresno, it very much exists. So um, I know that for most of California, uh, high speed rail is like this, this thing that may not ever come to California, but I drive under the tracks that they have built every day on the 99 when I drop my daughter off at, at preschool. So it's real. <laughs> um, and, and I think that is, that's a huge thing, right? Like we have- yeah, We don't see it. I mean, I'm in- the Bay Area. I have not seen it. Right. Yeah. And and so we have all these, they, what they did is um, in the construction phase, they have focused on building all of the bridges and viaducts first. And so if for whatever reason, the project never gets completed, what are we going to do with all of these, you know, bridges that we now have all across the, the Fresno area? But needless to say, you know, uh, before working as a journalist, I, I um, used to work for the city of Fresno and you know, there's a lot of planning going on into building a high speed rail station in downtown Fresno, figuring out how to make that a viable employment hub. There's a lot of folks in Fresno that are trying to figure out as the rest of the state gets even more expensive and more expensive than Fresno in terms of housing costs, what types of jobs might make sense to relocate in Fresno so that people can have a little bit um, less of a, of a cost of living um, while still remaining in California and getting all the benefits that are in California. So it's happening. Um, I guess that's my answer to that question. Um, that's actually interesting. I never thought about it, that you're faced with high speed, California's high speed rail every day. And I think of it as this. I know. One day there will be a train track going to LA. Yeah, no, my son is like, when do I get to ride it? Like every day. And I'm like. When you're an adult. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, can you, can we kind of segue a little bit into, um, you and I were chatting a little bit privately about this um, idea of exploring, and, and we've done this at Alta a bit, of during the pandemic, Californians have been more apt to take road trips and explore parts of the state they hadn't in lieu of taking big trips on airplanes and things that might expose them to COVID-19. Um, and so you had mentioned you had an idea for a podcast or some sort of audio program about the San Joaquin Valley. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, um, this is embarrassing now to have it. Oh, it's a great idea, share it. Okay, well, can I, let me give a little preface. So um, as a child, I was a math nerd and it's probably why I became an urban planner because my grandparents lived in LA and so Every time we drive to LA, I would just like study the map furiously and try to understand every single junction and overpass and where is this freeway going and why was it built? And then as I became an adult, now I have Wikipedia on my phone as I'm driving. So as we're driving through LA and through the traffic, I'm like, oh my gosh, this freeway was built here and this is the history and this is who got displaced by it and this is the community that was there before. And anyways, I love to nerd out on like all the details as I'm on a road trip. So I thought people from the Bay and LA drive through the Valley all the time. 
And to them, all of these little blocks of towns on the 99 or the five are nothing. To us or to some of us in the Valley, they're very um, meaningful historical places. And, or if you're from the Valley, if some of us don't even know, um, unless you're a reporter and it's literally your job to find out. So I've always thought about creating a podcast or some sort of audio that's timed to the different um, historical landmarks in the Valley so that as you're a Bay Area person driving to LA, um, that you'll get to learn more about it. You might even get inspired to stop, um, get some, you know, Filipino bread at, in Delano at the bakery there, or, you know, just something like that. So anyways, we'll, we'll see it happen maybe in 20 years. Okay. Well, speaking of Filipino bread at the bakery in Delano, this is what I want to know now. Where are they? If we are in Fresno and we're not going to drive through, we're going to stop and explore. What is your perfect day? The must visits, must stops in Fresno and the area? Yeah. Um, a perfect day is always going to have hiking in it. Um, <clears throat> Fresno is not too far, about 15 minutes, 10 minutes away from the foothills of the Sierra. So I would definitely start um, <clears throat> with a coffee from Fulton Street Coffee because they have a drink called a cafe con leche, which is just delicious. Just it's a must have. It's in downtown and they have great pastries that they get from a Oaxacan bakery as well. Um, and then Woodward Park is the park on the north side of Fresno that has a trail along the San Joaquin River that eventually leads into the San Joaquin River Gorge. And if you start there on a bike or on foot and just go for, for miles, it's, it's really beautiful. And I think the best way to kind of see the natural beauty of the San Joaquin Valley. Um, there is amazing, Fresno is known for its tacos. Um, sorry, people from LA, our tacos are superior. Um, <laughs> oh, oh and um, we have a we have a taco truck throwdown every year where all of the taco trucks come to the the baseball field in downtown and they have a competition and there's judges and it's this big deal i know fighting words yes but it's true i'm sorry to <laughs> just put it out there um my some of my favorite taquerias are um la elegante which is in chinatown and um el premio mayor which is in central fresno um chinatown is kind of a, a hot spot of really good food um, it doesn't look like a lot when you're driving around Chinatown, but if you're like, I want to eat really good food and see the weirdness of high speed rail construction, then definitely go to Chinatown because La Alicante is there. There's a really great soul food um, place called Chef Paul's. There's a um, Japanese uh, mochi confectionery that has been there for like over a hundred years called um, Kogetsu Do. It's really good. Um, there's a Japanese market called Central Fish that's just phenomenal. I love Central Fish. So Chinatown is where it's at. I love the very specific demographic that you were speaking to of people who want to both eat and nerd out on California Central High Speed Rail. That's <laughs> very, it might be a very small. Um, I'll but... know that we're friends if they, if they're like, yes. <laughs> um, and, oh, People are getting Bakersfield Deans are mad about the taco. Sorry. Listen, everyone <laughs> wants to think that they have the greatest tacos and be that as it may. Um, this I actually love the idea of the taco truck um throwdown. We have to we might have to explore that for um Alta. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about before we move on to audience questions, which again, don't don't be shy. Use the QA button. Um, I'm curious about a, Fresno motto. I was looking, I got Modesto and I'm so sorry, Fresno, confused with Fresno and thought of the, the famous motto, water, wealth, contentment, health, which I just find kind of entertaining. So I was trying to looking up mottos for Fresno and the two that have been like openly debated by the city council are be world-class, be Fresno, one, one option or a culture of excellence where people get the best every day, which I feel Lynn Rappaport, our coffee chief, would have a huge problem with. Um, what if, it, so right now Fresno does not have an official town motto that I that I know of yet. Do you have a suggestion? And please in the comments, I, I love a town motto. If you've got a suggestion for Fresno, let us know. But Danielle, Fresno expert, what is yours? 
Um, I see my colleague Lois suggesting Fres. Yes, that has been one that has been suggested by a lot of people. I love it. Um, I used to have a shirt that said Fres. No, how about Fres? Yes. Um, <laughs> uh, I feel I like the 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 format of Modesto's like water, wealth, contented health, and I I wish I had more creativity, but I feel like. <clears throat> Water and birds and tacos all need to be in a motto for Fresno and, and, and like creativity and angst. And those are like my five words that I would put in a motto. Um, there are so many birds here, like birds are everywhere. Um, and so I feel like if you're a birder, like you should also come to Fresno because you would have a lot of fun. Um, okay, so speaking of culture, and yes, Jill, we're going to compile as best as we can a list to all of those places. Um, I was taking notes, and I believe our assistant editor, Jessica Blau, has also been taking notes. I hope she has, um, but we've been doing the best we can. Okay, questions from the crowd before we wrap up. Judith asks, does Fresno Land promote the arts in Fresno, specifically poets and writers who have contributed to the literary legacy of both the Valley and the country? Do you know the collection, the Fresno Poets, featuring an array of talented poets? Yeah, I we do not, but there are some really fantastic um, people who do. Donald Monroe, who used to write, who used to be the arts um, editor for the Fresno Bee, has his own website, the Monroe Review, and he is great and keeping up to date on the art scene. Um, there is a great podcast out of Fresno State's MFA program, and I'm trying to remember what it's called. Um, but it highlights a lot of local Fresno poetry because um, we have a really great um, local art scene. And then um, there's an event called Lit Hop. Um, and if you're coming through Fresno in the springtime, um, it's a really great place where they have a bunch of venues set up and people do lots of poetry readings and writers workshops. And it's, it's a cool place to kind of get exposed to the local art scene. But no, we don't write about it, I'm sorry. Um, if you would like a little um, info on Fresno poets, we here at Alta did an interview with Sarah Borjas and published her poetry. She is a very proud um, Fresno poet and fantastic. So we will include a link to Sarah's work as well. Um, question from Sid. Can you discuss how the urban sprawl in Clovis is affecting Fresno's tax base, creating race and class segregation, concentrating poverty and undermining Fresno's school system? It is, no. <laughs> yeah, for, uh, if you look at the stats, Clovis, um, so Clovis is our, for those of you not familiar with Fresno, Clovis is our um, our suburban neighbor to the northeast of Fresno. Um, just quick geography, Fresno is about 550,000 people. Clovis is about 150,000 people, but quickly growing. Clovis is where a lot of the single family subdivisions are being built. That's still happening in Fresno, but to a lesser extent than in Fres and then in Clovis. Clovis has historically been a more um, affluent and majority white community. And that's changing somewhat, but the Clovis school system has really set up a reputation for being, um, you know, one of the best public school systems in California. And there is a subtext to that, absolutely, of it's a wider district. They have um, just a different way of doing things. And if you look at the statistics of um, racial segregation, um, you can see how the Clovis Unified Fresno Unified Boundary makes a, is actually a huge contributor to um, racial segregation within the region. Um, in terms of the tax base, you know that's always a big issue. Um, and something, you know, when I work, used to work for the city of Fresno, a lot of developers would use that as a, as a threat to kind of say, well, if you, if you're trying to push too hard to get something different in our development, we're just going to go to Clovis because they'll let us do whatever they want in Clovis. Um, it's, it's kind of sad. And I guess the last thing I'll say is I've had developers tell me straight away that they make a lot more money selling homes in Clovis Unified than in Fresno Unified. And if that doesn't say anything about the state of segregation in Fresno, I'm not, I'm not sure what else does. Um, uh, do you, how much of uh, climate change is, do you cover <clears throat> climate change in Fresno land? And, um, you know, how much of your coverage is, is focused on climate change? Yeah, um, I mean, climate is a thread almost through everything these days. Um, 
you can't cover the drought in California and certainly in the San Joaquin Valley without the overarching narrative of climate change. Um, I mean, it's the way that climate is impacting us in the valley are mainly two things, um, drought and air quality. Um, but the air quality, both from the fires, but just more generally, um, we have always had challenges with, with, um, with air quality because of both the two um, transportation corridors that go through the valley that have a lot of truck traffic, but then also agriculture has a pretty big air quality footprint. So it's a big issue. We cover it more in water than we do in air quality. I wish we did more air quality reporting. Um, and it's something that I'm hoping we're gonna be able to do more this year. Lynn had also asked about air quality. Um, do you know anything about um, Valley, hang on, I'm juggling lots of questions here, um, Valley fever? Yeah, I mean, I haven't reported on it. There's a great reporter at Valley Public Radio who's done some great reporting on Valley fever. But basically, when you breathe in all the dust particles that can cause some pretty serious um, illness and complications. And one of those is valley fever. And it's a huge issue for people who are already immune compromised and um, something to, to definitely watch out for. Um, uh, I'm, thank you. <laughs> um, I'm seeing a couple of mentions of what is the Blossom Trail? And is it gonna oh, happen again this year? Yeah, I grew up near the Blossom Trail. Um, so outside of Fresno, there's many orchards, peach orchards, plums, nectarines, um, citrus, but mostly the stone fruit. Um, and in, and it's on the Eastern side of the Central Valley towards the foothills. And in starting in February through early April, the blossoms on these stone fruit trees are just phenomenal. And so if you start in Reedley, I think it's in Reedley where you start, um, you can bike or there's parts of it you can walk or drive and it's it's just really stunning to look at all of the blossoms. Can we add that to your list of a perfect day? And Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, switching gears here, Chris asks, Fresno, his words, not mine, has a legacy of being a hotbed of crime. Um, has that changed in recent years? What, 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 what's the crime situation in Fresno right now? I'm not super versed on the statistics recently. What I will say is that my understanding has been that it is like any other major city. Um, you know, I moved from Oakland. Um, it feels very similar. And I've lived in New York. I've lived in Washington, D.C. Um, I think it's pretty much on par with with most major cities. And and again, like like many cities, there's pockets of crime. There's pots, pockets of good and bad, and it doesn't feel very different. But I can't give you a, a rundown of the stats. Um, that's okay. We're, we're really jumping all over the place. Are the underground gardens still there? They are. They the are. Underground I know they took a hiatus for, for the pandemic, but they're back. Um, the underground gardens are... Um, uh, the underground gardens are this beautiful, gar like literally underground gardens. It's, it's um, if you're driving on the 99, you get off on Shaw and uh, it's right there off of Shaw. And it's, it's like this guy, I don't know his name. I'm really bad. Forcier, William Forcier. Sorry, it came back to me. Um, he set up this like beautiful garden underground and it's, it's stunning. Is it literally underground? It literally is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Added to the list of unexpected Fresno. Unexpected Fresno. Yeah. Podcast name, perhaps motto. Mm -hmm. um, oh, the Rogue Festival in March. Yes. I mean, this is, so if, if people are looking for a, I think that this Alta Live should just be the impetus for your family road trip to the Fresno area um, and, and explore an incredible time there. I do want to give, um, before we leave and let you go back to work on Fresno land and, um, tell, you know, educating um, Fresnans about everything that's happening in their city. I do want to give a big shout out to Brad Balukjian, who wrote the article, Balukjian, um, for Alta. This is, we're going to, we're going to send you all an email with a link to this interview. Again, um, Alta's assistant editor, Jessica, and I are going to grab as many of the links to all of the spots um, recommendations that Danielle has made today and send you those in an email as well. We're going to include Brad's great article on Danielle's work and Fresno land links to Fresno land, of course, 
Um, and we're going to invite you to next week's Alta Live, where we are. What's next week? Oh, we're talking with um, Dr. Lauren Esposito. She is a scientist at the California Academy of Sciences, and she is co founder of 500 Queer Scientists, which is a group advo advocating for um, visibility in the queer STEM community. So um, I'm gonna, you're gonna get an email invite to um, an information on all of that to our awesome crew that joined us today. Thank you. Danielle, thank you so much for um, taking this time, offering all of your expertise, inspiring us all to come and visit you, knock on your door, say hi, show us around, <laughs> take us on a carriage ride through Fresno. Um, I'm so grateful. Yeah, thanks for having me, it's been fun. All right, take care everyone, stay safe.